Hello and welcome to the Capitol Report on NTD Television. I'm Steve Lance. Vaccine mandates for military members is on track to being reversed. Lawmakers reached a deal to end the mandate in the annual defense bill. But the White House declines to say if President Biden will sign off on it. NTD's Melina Wisecup brings us more from Capitol Hill. Lawmakers have released the text for the National Defense Authorization Act for 2023. It's well above what President Biden requested at a top line number of $860 billion. It increases pay for service members and it repeals the vaccine mandate. Specifically, it requires the Secretary of Defense to rescind the mandate that requires members of the armed forces to be vaccinated against COVID-19. Republicans, of course, cheered this language, but the White House today calls it a mistake while declining to say whether or not President Biden would sign off on this or veto it if this NDAA bill reaches his desk with this vaccine mandate repeal language in it. Here's those official White House comments from today. So we still believe it's a mistake. I won't get ahead of process here. I, the only other thing I'd say is the, the, the president uh, as well as Secretary Austin have been very, very clear um, that they support this vaccination uh, requirement. Now, this language that repeals the vaccine mandate is very specific, and there are still some senators who are pushing for more. Today, we heard from a handful of Republican senators who want to add a, another measure to rehire uh, members of the military who have been discharged for not getting the shot. There are over a thousand Coast Guard members who have either been discharged or are in the process of being discharged, uh, and those people have lost pay. They've lost promotions. We're being told by many that the Department of Defense is going to deal with those individuals fairly on a case-by-case -case basis as things move forward. What leads us to believe that they will, in fact, deal with these on a case-by-case -case basis? When and Senator Mike Lee and Senator Rick Scott both say they are still committed to not advancing the NDAA if this extra language is not added that reinstates discharged uh, service members. And we asked specifically how they're pushing to get this done. Senator Rand Paul told me that this was in their discussions today. They're working out a deal to get an, um, a vote on this as an amendment when this bill comes to the Senate floor and this would be approved by just a simple majority vote. Now this bill is likely to come to the Senate floor sometime next week. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. A Democratic Senate majority secured with Senator Raphael Warnock's win last night in Georgia. How lawmakers react and what the White House says about Democrats' legislative agenda. NTD's Iris Tau reports. The people have spoken. We put up one heck of a fight. Senator Raphael Warnock defeated Republican challenger Herschel Walker in Georgia's Senate runoff. And that ensures Democrats an outright Senate majority for the rest of President Biden's term. After one year, 10 months, and 17 days of the longest 50-50 Senate in history, 51, yeah. a slim majority. And the White House today claiming credit for Warnock's win. What you saw Senator Warnock do and what you saw Democrats uh, do is run on the president's agenda. And the White House asked that a slim majority would give the Biden administration more breathing room. When it comes to the president's legislative agenda, when it comes to Democrats' legislative agenda, it's that it gives us a little bit more breathing room, a little bit more ability to deliver for the American people. Much of Biden's legislative agenda, though, is expected to get stuck in the House, which will be controlled by Republicans for the next two years. But Democratic control of the Senate can help Biden in other ways. His nominees for his cabinet and for courts, for example, are now much more likely to get confirmed. And he also won't need to rely as much on moderate Democrats like Senator Joe Manchin, who was reluctant to support major parts of Biden's agenda. Meanwhile, the White House says gun control is among Biden's top priorities to get the assault weapons ban done. It doesn't matter if it's the next three weeks or beyond, the president is going to continue to fight for this. Meanwhile, Republicans have also just released a long list of priorities for the new Congress. And that includes everything from immigration and China to seeking accountability from the Biden administration for what they call an open border crisis. Reporting from the White House, Iris Tao, NTD News. Lawmakers on Capitol Hill are beginning to address the rising suicide rates of border agents at the southern border. Republican Congressman Tony Gonzalez and Democratic Congressman Henry Cuellar held a press conference in front of the Capitol to address this issue. 
But there's no doubt that the what is happening at the border is impacting our agents. And you just the, the numbers speak for itself. The fact that 14 uh, Customs and Border Patrol agents have committed suicide. Something is wrong. What that is this year, 14 Customs and Border Protection agents committed suicide. Eight of them were Border Patrol agents. Three cases took place over a 15 day span in November. Gonzalez and Cuellar both represent border districts in the state of Texas. They say they will be introducing a bipartisan bill intended to solve this issue. Lawmakers in the Senate, meanwhile, are also working on a border bill. Democratic Senator Kirsten Sinema and Republican Senator Tom Tillis expect their bipartisan bill to be voted on by the end of the current Congress. It would extend Title 42 for another year, boost security at the border, and at the same time, give the roughly two million illegal immigrants a pathway to citizenship. The Senate passed the Respect for Marriage Act last week, which would codify same-sex marriage. Many critics are concerned that the bill would make individuals and businesses who have a religious opposition vulnerable to lawsuits. Now joining us to discuss the conflict between religious liberty and same-sex marriage, we have Matt Sharp, senior counsel from Alliance Defending Freedom. Matt Sharp, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Matt, some of the biggest concerns folks have over the uh, Respect for Marriage Act is the interpretation, uh, is that the interpretation of the law is so broad that it can expose a lot of uh, people, business and businesses to liability. Do you believe this to be the case? And if so, uh, tell us how. Yeah, absolutely I do. When I look at the so-called Respect for Marriage Act, the two things that concern us the most Number one, it's giving broad new power to the federal government to be able to go after religious organizations and people of faith that hold to the view that marriage is between one man and one woman. So we could see the federal government starting to leverage that power to punish those organizations. So you could see this playing out with like a faith-based adoption provider that believes kids deserve a home with a married mother and father being punished by the government because of its beliefs. And then second, it opens the door for private lawsuits against these organizations. So an activist group like the ACLU could utilize the Respect for Marriage Act to bring costly federal lawsuits against these organizations because of their beliefs. And sometimes even if those organizations win, the very process of being dragged into court is the punishment. So those are just some of the, the many concerns that we have with this legislation. Now, I want to ask you about a case that has just been elevated to the Supreme Court, I believe, uh, originating in Colorado, where I believe you had a web designer that was put into a situation where she was forced to betray her deeply held uh, religious convictions. Uh, how will a case like this be impacted by the new law, and what effect might the Supreme Court decision have on this case and others in the future? Yeah, uh, this is the Lori Smith 303 creative case that Alliance Defending Freedom is representing Lori. And we think Lori's case has become that much more important in light of the Respect for Marriage Act. Uh, Lori involves a case where she doesn't wanna be compelled to create speech supporting same-sex marriage. And so a win for Lori could provide an important protection down the road when the Respect for Marriage Act gets misused to target people of faith, to target religious organizations because of their beliefs. Because regardless of the motivation for a person believing that marriage is between a man and a woman, whether it's because of religious beliefs or otherwise, they should be protected as they speak out, as they express their views on this, and not fear government punishment or costly lawsuits for doing so. Are you getting any sense of how the uh, Supreme Court might rule on this case? Well, we were very encouraged by the uh, questions in the oral argument on Monday. Lots of them focused on questioning Colorado's interpretation, questioning their enforcement of this law against people of faith in Colorado, those that hold to the view that marriage is between one man and one woman. And so we were very encouraged to see time and time again the court recognize that the First Amendment does indeed limit Colorado and other government actors. And so we're hopeful to see a strong victory that would protect Lori, other artists in Colorado, and really people all across the country that worry about government coercion of their speech. Now, on the other hand, uh, we're hearing stories like the one just out of Richmond, Virginia, about a restaurant allegedly refusing service to a Christian group citing staff dignity. Uh, have you heard of more discrimination cases against people of faith, and how are these cases being address? Yeah, unfortunately, we do hear stories like that all the time. And I think it highlights an important difference that came up in that 303 creative case. No one is saying that someone should have the right to turn someone away because of who they are, because of their beliefs, because of their orientation or race or any other thing. Rather, 
it's all about the message. So in Lori's case, Lori serves everyone, regardless of whether they're LGBT or any other characteristic. It's the specific message that she doesn't want to be forced to speak by the government. And that's very different than someone turning away an organization or group because they're religious. That looks more like the who. That looks more like saying, I will not serve you because of who you are. And that is something we can all agree is impermissible and should not be allowed. But it's also very different from the artist that says, I'm happy to serve you, whoever you are. Just don't force me to speak a message or celebrate an event that violates my beliefs and my religious convictions. Matt Sharp, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And Washington, D.C. is one step closer to making bus rides on public transit free. The city council unanimously passed a bill yesterday. It would make bus rides free as early as July 2023 and deposit $100 monthly on a registered Smart Trip card beginning in 2024. The final vote on the bill is scheduled for December 20th. Then D.C. would become the first major city to offer free bus transportation. Today marks the 81st anniversary of Japan's attack on the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. The Japanese Imperial Navy launched the strike on December 7, 1941, drawing the United States into World War II. More than 2,000 Americans were killed. The bombings also destroyed a significant number of U.S. battleships and planes. President Franklin Roosevelt gave a speech to Congress on the following day, famously calling the attack a date which will live in infamy. Shortly thereafter, Congress passed a declaration of war against Japan, marking the official beginning of America's role in World War II. Thank you for watching the Capitol Report. If you want to see our full broadcast, check us out at epochtv.com.